Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the OWASP conference. My name is Svetlana Samko. Uh, I am volunteer in the OWASP community, Agile Technical Project Manager in Verizon Connect, developer advocate, advocate and mentor for women in tech, uh, web development mentor, and I have a passion for security, data science, and AI. And I will, be, I will be moderating this session. And during the next 45 minutes, you will be listening to Project Showcase of ASP ASVS project presented by Josh Grossman. Uh, please submit any questions you have during the session in the Q&A tab, just to the right of the, this video in the Whoa platform. I will be asking Josh questions that you submitted there in the last 10 minutes of this session. And please note the chat in uh, Zoom is disabled, so you will not be able to add questions there, just in Hoover platform. You can leave comments, you can use chat, so feel free to add them during the session. Josh has worked as a consultant in IT application security and risk for 15 years now, as well as software developer. In that time, he has sent the good he has seen, sorry, the good, the bad, and the stuff which is sadly, luckily, still covered by an NDA. He is currently Chief Technology Officer for Bones Security, where he spent his time helping organizations improve and get better value from their application security processes and providing specialist application security advice. In his spare time, he co-leads the WASP Application Security Verification Standard Project and is on the WASP Israel Chapter Board. Please welcome Josh and over to you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, hi everyone. And welcome to uh, my talk about the uh, WASP ASVS. I'm very excited to uh, be at another uh, Global AppSec Conference for OWASP. It's always a really great event and lots of really great talks. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be uh, one, of, one of the first ones. So uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's dive in. So I guess in terms of uh, who am I, first of all, I think uh, Svetlana covered that pretty well already. Um, working as an application security consultant about security, um, consulting, training, generally you know, helping organizations build uh, secure and uh, build uh, secure software. Um, and uh, in my in my spare time, I'm a co-leader of the OWASP SVS project. I'm also uh, have contributed to various other OWASP projects as well. And uh, I'm also on the OWASP Israel chapter board. Uh, we uh, organise uh, obviously our chapter meetups and also the uh, AppSec IL conference that we've uh, organised for the last few years. So uh, yeah, OWASP is very much a hobby, and uh, in particular the the ASVS. So. Today, I want to talk about a few things. Um, I'm going to give a bit, bit of a background to the ASVS, sort of talk about it in the context of some of the other OWASP projects that you may be more, more familiar with, um, talk a little bit about what the project is, what it aims to do, how it can help. Um, I want to talk about a few things that make it interesting. I think that uh, it's, you know, it's important to pull out some of the highlights and you know, why, why I think this is such a, an important project and why I think this is a, can be very beneficial for everyone who's involved in, in software security. Um, I want to talk about how you can use it, how you can get involved and uh, you know, contribute back to the project. And most importantly, I want to talk about the, the roadmap as we plan for version 5.0 that we're hoping to prepare for the end of the year, which uh, is certainly a, a big important step. And uh, hopefully you can also help contribute to that as well. So without further ado, um, so what is the ASVS? So, it's so the first question a lot, a lot of people ask. And I, I like to say, well, let's start off with not what is the ASVS, but what is the ASVS not? What isn't the ASVS? Um, I think in some ways that's a, a good way of, of starting. So if we start with the OWASP top 10, the OWASP top 10 risks, this is probably you know, the most famous OWASP project, the most well-known OWASP project. Um, and this is a, a list of the top 10 bad things that could happen from an application security perspective that gets released uh, every three to four years. Um, and you know, this is a really great project, a really important project. It's led by a group of you know, very well-respected experts in the field. And the most recent versions, 2017 version, the 2021 version, they had 
a lot of really great um, feedback from the public and you know, they're very much developed in the open and they used a lot of public data and they used a lot of public information to say, well, you know, here's, here's what we think should go into these projects. Uh, you, know, you can see it's on the, on the GitHub repository there and you know, it's, it's, it's very frequently cited, but the important key word here, I guess, is, is awareness. This is a, an application security awareness document. And you know, the idea behind the, the, the behind the project, behind the top ten, and you know, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't a secret. This isn't sort of my interpretation. This is the the purpose of the project. It's to spread awareness about application security issues, about web security issues. Um, these are a set of issues that can go wrong. It is very much not designed to be a standard. Um, we shouldn't talk about it as a standard. We shouldn't talk about you know, or we comply with the OS top ten, or we test according to OS top ten. It's meant to be an awareness, awareness document. It's not a comprehensive list. It doesn't have every single problem that we encounter from an application security perspective. It's here are the top 10 things that we think you should be thinking about. And you know, sometimes those things are very specific. Sometimes those things are, are, are very wide. Um, and also another, another drawback that I guess I think, you know, may, may make it sort of challenging to build upon is that it's very much you know, here are a list of 10 problems. Here are a list of things you need to be worried about, that you need to be concerned about. You know, if you dig into it, it does provide some ideas about solutions as well, but it's primarily focused around you know, the top 10 risks, the top 10 problems. So great, great project for awareness, but you know, can we use it to, to build secure software Le less easily? So there's also another OS top 10, OS loves top 10s, um, as you may have noticed. And there's another top, top 10 that's called a top 10 proactive controls. So this is another really great project and it's, uh, it's focus is slightly different though. It's about, it's more of a guidance document and it's about pulling out sort of 10, I guess, best practices, 10 leading practices for building secure software. So we can see that, you know, these are sort of proactive practical ways that you can build software in a secure way you know these are things that we can we can actually do these are things that we you know, these aren't just oh no what's what am i going to do about this problem these are practices that we can take and apply in our development um and because of that this is this is a great starting point this is a great uh, place to start in terms of okay i want to build a secure application what do i need to think about first what security issues do i need to think about first and is also a lot more practical. Like I say, it's not just a, a list, it's very much a document with, you know, here's a topic and here's some narrative about that document. Um, and that gives us a, the ability to say, well, okay, I'm building a software product and here's some good practices that I can follow. Here's some good ideas that I can follow to make sure that I'm building it in a secure way, which is, which is great. And it's much more practical for developers to take and start working with. And it also has a great, great team of leaders, very, very experienced leaders in the field who, uh, prepare the, the documents and prepare the guidance. And um, yeah, I, I'd certainly highly recommend it as sort of a, a, a gateway into building secure software. The problem we have is that it's also not completely comprehensive. It's not designed to be a fully comprehensive um, application security standard. It's, it's again, more for awareness. It's more about you know, here, the top 10 things you might want to think about. Um, it's not organized like a standard. It's not organized and, and designed in a way that, okay, we're going to follow this standard. We're going to follow this uh, um, set of requirements in order to build our project or build our software. It's organized as, you know, here's the top 10 things to think about. But what if we want to build a product and we want to build our, uh, our piece of software and we want to have, okay, here's all the things we need to think about. Here's a sort of methodical way to think about building security into this product. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? So as you might have guessed um, from the title of the talk, the answer is the OWASP application security verification standard. So this is intended to be requirements for building a secure application. It's designed to be an actual standard. Um, the idea is that you can work through the standard, you can work through the requirements of the standard and feel confident, okay, these are the requirements that I need to take into account that I need to, um, to implement in order to build a secure application. It's, and it's, you know, it's structured in a way that will allow that to be, to be done. It's not just a narrative document, it's sort of structured in a set of requirements that are relatively self-contained to allow you to say, okay, how am I gonna handle this one? Okay, well, how am I gonna handle this one? They're much more sort of 
easier to digest because it's split into smaller sections. It's designed to be leading practices. The idea being that we can't release a new version of the standard every six months because you know, it's a standard, it needs to stay a little bit static. It needs to, you know, people need to be able to rely on it and not changing every five seconds. Um, because of that, we try and make sure that we're looking ahead and thinking, okay, what are we gonna be good controls and good requirements and uh, good practice, not just now, but over the next few years as well as a, as a standard continues to be relevant. Um, it's also developed very much in the open. Like I said earlier on about the, uh, the OS top 10, it's developed in, in GitHub, all the issues and discussions are in GitHub. People can submit issues, people can submit feedback, people can submit uh, pull requests with uh, suggested contents. And it means we get a lot, a lot of eyes on the, on the standard and a lot of input into what should be in the standard. To make it easier to apply, um, because being a standard and being comprehensive is quite large, it's split into three different levels. So level one is what we consider to be the, the minimum level. Um, this is the idea is this should be the minimum that a company has to comply with, an application has to comply with in order to be considered to have a, a minimum level of security, a minimum sort of acceptable level of security. Ideally for applications that are processing less secure data or less sensitive data or are less critical, but it's an important starting point. I mean, this itself has around 130 requirements, which is a lot, um, but obviously, each one of those is split into you know, each one of those is, is, is quite self-contained and quite specific so it's not like we're having to um, think of a whole program just to deal with one requirement ideally we should be able to look at a requirement figure out how we're implementing it and move on so although there are 130 of them you know should, each one shouldn't be too time consuming to implement another interesting point about it is that it should be possible to verify these requirements using penetration testing now Obviously, hopefully we have all sorts of different security activities going on, but generally the, the very minimum security activity will someone will have, an organization will have will be penetration testing. And all of these should be testable by someone who's on the outside of the application, performing tests on the application to, to see how it responds to certain attacks or to certain uh, exploitation attempts. So that is a, is a useful, uh, useful characteristic as well, because it means we can potentially get a, a very sort of basic reading. Okay, are we doing everything that should be in level one of the ASVS? And that's, like I say, a good starting point and certainly an important starting point to, to ease into having a, a comprehensively secure application. Um, but it is only the starting point and that brings us to level two, which is what we'd consider the standard level of security. So we would consider this as the required level for any applications that are processing sensitive data or are being relied upon for, for critical business functions. And that's gonna, probably gonna be a, a large proportion of the, the applications that are being built and you know, anything that processes personal data or allows people to log in and store sensitive data is going to be included in this. It brings another set of requirements, another roughly 130 requirements, which again, a lot of requirements each reasonably self-contained, maybe slightly more difficult than level one requirements, but still perfectly achievable. Um, but to verify these requirements is going to be a little bit more tricky. We can't just do this from you know, someone on the outside looking in it's gonna need some inside knowledge as well, some understanding of how the application is working behind the scenes or how the processes around the application are, are working behind the scenes. Now, whilst on the one hand, okay, that's more difficult, that requires a more in-depth level of testing a more in-depth level of assessment, we, we would argue that we need to start hybrid testing anyway. We can't just rely on external penetration testing to, to verify the security of an application. We'd, you know, certainly my uh, previous, uh, previous job where I was focused on security testing, we would always try and make the penetration testing as uh, transparent as possible to get as much information about how the application is working behind the scenes in order to better target the testing and to get better coverage. And uh, that's the sort of tests that we should be aiming for in general. And that sort of test should also be able to verify level two as well. So it doesn't finish there though. If there are certain applications that are particularly critical, have very high value transactions, very, very sensitive data, um, we would recommend considering level three as well, which is the advanced level. Um, any application that requires the highest levels of trust should uh, be complying with this level. This level includes all of the previous requirements plus an additional 20 requirements. And you know, it's not a huge number of extra requirements, but at the same time, 
these will generally be more involved. They'll be maybe more difficult to implement and, and, and generally more require more work, but they are what we see is important for, for the most critical of applications. Um, again, we can want to start with level one as a, as a basic. We don't want to stop there. We want to go to level two for any application that's going to be in any way sensitive with level three being reserved for the most critical applications, the most sensitive applications. The idea being that we can ease gradually into making sure that we're complying with this standard. So who's involved in this? We've also got a, a, a great leadership team. Um, really, really proud and sort of honored to be among this, this group of people who, who steer this project. But it's not just the leaders. There's a lot of people who've contributed ideas, contributed feedback, also reviewed versions of the document at various stages and uh, provide lots of useful input as well. And as I said, you can be involved as well. We certainly welcome contributions and ideas from, from all over. And uh, you know, we, we'd be glad to hear from anyone who wants to provide their feedback or provide their ideas. Um, and like I say, we'll look at later on at uh, where, where, where the standard is stored. So a bit of basic information about the standard itself and how, sort of how, it's, uh, how it's structured. So one of the great things about it is we've written, the standard is written in, in Markdown language within GitHub, um, which is nice because it makes it a lot easier to uh, maintain and modify the, uh, you know, the text of the standard, the information in the standard, but then take that basic text and export it to all sorts of different uh, output formats, depending on what your use case is. We've got scripts to generate a PDF file, a Word file, a CSV, various JSON formats. Again, whatever whatever works best for the use that you have for the standard. But the idea is by starting off in the in the basic markdown that uh, renders like nicely in GitHub and uh, is easy to trace, then it, uh, it makes for a good basis. And you know, because it's so easy to trace and because it's a, a textual format, it's very easy to see sort of the ev evolution of the requirements and where requirements have come from, and um, also trace those you know, to the the uh, point in time when the requirement was created or written or committed and the issue where the requirement was discussed it's just a lot easier to understand the rationale okay well, where did this requirement come from in the first place it's not just a you know we're not just publishing a closed pdf where the uh, provenance of the requirements and the logic behind it is all sort of hidden in some back room somewhere the vast majority of discussion is in github and often if you're if you look at a requirement and think, okay, well, you know, why is that requirement written in that way? You can search the ID and the issues and discover the discussion and discover the discussion where what that requirement should include um, was discussed. And I think that's really useful for understanding the, the, the backing context behind you know, why certain requirements are written the way they are written. It also makes it a lot easier to translate. Um, we currently have quite a few translations, various different languages that uh, people have kindly uh, taken the time to do and contribute. And that's for a variety of different versions and the information about uh, which translations exist for which versions are on our uh, on the site. But it makes it a lot easier when it's all in that textual format that it's then easy to swap out the English with the uh, other language that it's being translated to. One of the nice features about some of the early sections around uh, authentication, authorization, and session management is that they're mapped to uh, the NIST standard uh, 863B, which is uh, Digital Identity Guidelines Authentication Lifecycle Management. So NIST um, is an American organization, non-governmental organization that did some great work around you know, leading practices for authentication and general authorization uh, mechanisms and they published a, a set of guidance, which is very useful, very sort of well-researched. It's again, a bit uh, more, more like a, a wordy document rather than a set of requirements. And as part of developing version four, we took the, um, the concepts in that NIST document and broke them up into requirements that are then in some of the early chapters of the SBS. That's uh, a nice link to base off their research, but also keep it in the form of requirements that we'd like to see in the SBS. There are various other mappings as well, um, which we can see on the face of the standard, including uh, proactive controls and CWE. And there's also a, a cheat sheets mapping as well, which we'll see in a sec. The ASVS is designed to help comply with uh, PCI DSS 6.5.x. Uh, we need to check where we are with the most recent version of PCI, but in general, it should uh, help you comply with that section as well. Uh, the idea being, you know, we want this to be the application security standard. So what does it look like? 
so this is a, a typical page from the from the ASBS. So we can see that uh, up here we've got the, the chapter name, access control, a little bit of text about what the chapter is talking about, you know, what's going to be what sort of requirements are going to be in this in this chapter. Then each chapter is split into sections. We try to make it sort of logically numbered, um, x dot y dot z style numbering. So it's a lot easier to find, okay, where is this requirement, which section, which subject, which section does it relate to, which chapter is it in, just to make it easier to navigate around. Um, so we can see we've got the, the section heading here, then we've got the requirements in this particular section. We can see that uh, each of these requirements is a level one requirement, meaning that it's relevant for both for level one, for level two, and for level three. If this was just a level two requirement, then level one here will be blank um, because it wouldn't be re relevant for level one, so it'd only be relevant for level two and level three. Um, we can see CWE. CWE is Common Weakness Enumeration. Um, it's a project from, from MITRE to try and categorize different uh, security weaknesses, and it's that's a, a useful mapping to say, Okay, well, you know, I have this here, this requirement, but what's the what's the rationale behind this requirement? What what weakness, what issue, what vulnerabilities is this, is this uh, requirement coming to rectify? So the, having that mapping there is sort of useful for that context as well. Um, very subtly down here, we can see a link to the OWASP proactive controls item that uh, this requirement relates to. Uh, it's just a, a a nice way of of, of mapping across, saying, okay, well, if I'm already dealing with the proactive controls, which ASVS items am I, should I already be handling, which ASVS items should I already be uh, ha have uh, have solved. Um, you may be able to use that as sort of a, an initial stage to say, okay, well, I, if I do, if I want to start off with the ASVS and I can't do all 130 items in level one, where, where can I start? And it may be that you can use the items that are mapped to the proactive controls as a guiding point to say, well, these are the top 10 proactive controls, so they you know, that, that uh, means there's a certain level of importance attached to them, so maybe I want to start there. Um, but that's not necessarily an official position, but it's, it's something to think about if you're, again, looking at how to get to that first stage of how do, you know, how do I achieve level one? Where do I start? So the standards split into a set of chapters, and you can, as you can see, this is quite, quite comprehensive. Various different areas covering various different uh, various different chapters covering various different areas of security, sort of all the things that you expect to see from a, a comprehensive application security standards. And again, each of these has sections and requirements within the sections related to that particular area. Ultimately, all of these chapters should be important for your application. It may be there are certain requirements that are out of scope in your particular situation for whatever reason, but certainly as a starting point, you need to assume that all of the chapters are going to be relevant for you. So you know, if you've got an API that you've written, just because there's a chapter called API Web Service doesn't mean you don't, you don't have to look at everything else. Your know, API may give you certain additional requirements you need to take into account, but ultimately all of the chapters should be relevant and all of the, all of the chapters have to be considered for, for um, securing the application. So, when I'm giving a talk about the SVS, I deliberately don't want to start talking about, okay, here's this standard, here's what's in this, here's this chapter, here's what's in this chapter, and go through all the requirements. It's <laughs> there are a lot of requirements, as we know, um, and it doesn't make it for super interesting. So what I like to do is try and say, okay, well, let's let's just pull out a few a few interesting examples. Um, like I say, OWASP loves its top tens, um, so I sometimes talk about the OWASP SVS top ten cool features. Um, but on this occasion, because I want to make sure I save some time for the future as well, I'm going to restrict myself to the OS top five cool features. Um, so here are a set of things that I think are interesting about the ASPS and sort of demonstrate why it's an important project. So SSRF is a, a type of vulnerability that has been very prevalent over the last few years. Now, back in 2017, they released an updated version of the OS top 10. And Within 2018, 2019, 2022, we're already seeing widespread exploitation of um, issues related to server-side request forgery. But partially because it wasn't in the OS top 10, it didn't have the prominence, it didn't have the awareness that other, maybe older and better known vulnerabilities had. 
And in fact, there was almost a, there was a discussion about whether there needed to be some sort of point release of the OS top 10, some sort of interim release of the OS top 10 to highlight the importance of SSRF. Now in ASVS, because we've been designed to begin with to be a comprehensive standard, we had that in to begin with. We have already had that in, we had various different requirements related to SSRF to make sure that you know, you're thinking about this issue and you're thinking about how you're going to deal with this issue. We don't have to wait for you know, another version of the OS top 10 to come out, which I think you know, in 2021, SSRF was going to be you know, more, more significantly highlighted. We didn't have to wait for that though, because we were a comprehensive standard. We could have all of the different issues in. We weren't just restricted to having a, a top 10. And that means that anyone who's following the SVS should have been aware of this issue and should have been able to, to combat this issue. And that's uh, a big plus of being a standard like this. We didn't need to... Uh, yeah, fit ourselves into a, a particular frame, a temp template or a particular uh, time frame, and also, whilst the standard maintains, you know, also maintains static versions of the standard, the I guess the bleeding edge version is always being updated with new comments and uh, new information. And if you don't need to strictly comply to a standard, but you want to see, okay, what's most up to date today, you can also use that, and that's uh, always there on the on the master branch of the of the GitHub repository. So the big advantage of having this this comprehensive standard and this ongoing development of the standard. So we've tried to bring in sort of specifically useful practices, practices that we see that deal with very sort of well-known real life threats. So the idea of password reuse and password stuffing has been a major issue over the last few years. The idea that an organization will get breached and a list of known username and password combinations will get disclosed either hashed or not hashed and then attackers will start performing a credential stuffing attack where they start trying to use these breached usernames and passwords on other services as well to see whether they can get these valid credentials to work on other services as well so because of this we wanted to make sure that there was some sort of requirement that would co cover this issue and so we require that that uh, organizations are, lo are looking at not looking at passwords, you know, literally, obviously you don't, don't want anyone to be looking at the password, but that the system is checking that the passwords aren't commonly used passwords or potentially warning if a password has been seen in a previous breach, because this is the main, main indicator that an account may get breached in your application is if someone's reused an a password from a different application. So we try to make sure that we're having these sort of useful practical requirements that actually deal with real life impact. Um, and again, it's very much about Make sure this is a usable standard that provides proactive leading practices. So certainly when I first had a look at the standard, um, I was familiar with the, uh, with the first three items on this slide with the uh, secure flag, the HTTP only flag, the same site flag is a little bit newer, um, but also quite well known. But I hadn't heard of the host prefix. Um, that was new to me when I when I first started with the ASVS. But that's something that's been included since uh, since version four. And in fact, the idea behind the host prefix is that it's if you name a cookie with this particular prefix, you call it a name that starts off with this uh, underscore underscore host hyphen, then the browser will specifically configure the cookie in the in the most secure possible way. So regardless of what other, other attributes you specified or what other um, configuration you specified for that cookie, the browser will immediately know, okay, because it has this prefix, I need to protect this cookie in a particular way without having to manually set all those different configurations. Um, and that's something that's still at, uh, in theory, it's still at the RFC stage, but in practice, it's shipping in pretty much every single browser already. And it's an example of, again of a of, of sort of forward-looking leading practice about that uh, you know what is a good protection that we can recommend recommend today and maybe is less well known but will improve the overall security of uh, of an application and organization. So even though this is what less well known, we chose this to include as something that we could see as being a a worthy and well used control a well well used control and a well supported control. Again, it means by having this level of granularity and having this level of, of uh, comprehensiveness, we can spe make specific um, recommendations to build a more secure application. So, you know, obviously we want to deal with the 
I guess the most well-known and the most risky issues and the most uh, sort of widespread exploited issues. But we also want to think about the edge cases as well. We don't want to just want to think about, well, here are the top 10 issues, here are the top 20 issues, here are you know, what the, the most well-known issues. We want to think about slightly more, more unusual issues as well, but that can still have a significant security impact on the application. So this particular control about abnormal behavior. If you imagine someone working, let's say, in a call center, and their job is to that customers will phone them up and they will look at the customer's record and they will help them out or give them advice or they'll make changes to the customer's record. And yeah, you know, that's their job. You know, maybe they can expect to have, let's say, 10 calls an hour. So if they get 10 calls an hour, they're probably looking at 10 customers an hour. And they're opening up 10 customer records and they may be exposed to sensitive data for that customer, but ultimately you know, that's their job. Their job is to see the customer's sensitive data and help them you know, modify their records or perform actions on their behalf. But what if that call center operator is accessing 20 records an hour, 30, 50, 100, 1,000, 10,000 an hour? Now, in theory, they have permissions to do that. They have authorization to do that. That's theoretically, it's their job to view customer records, but certainly not at that volume in that type period of time. You know, that's clearly not within business expectations for that person to be doing. And you know, that's the sort of subtlety that you can't necessarily capture with a top 10 or with a, okay, we're just going to focus on the, um, the most well-known issues. But it is an important part of the security of the application. You know, what's happening here is there's some sort of malicious software on the uh, customer service agent's machine that is uh, pulling data out of the application, or is the customer service operator themselves doing something they shouldn't be doing or have using some sort of automated script to pull out a lot of customer information. Yeah, that sort of information, that can, that's the sort of uh, issue that is important for an organization to know about. But again, it requires this subtle understanding of um, what is expected, what's considered normal for the application. And the nice thing about having a comprehensive standard is that we can go into that level of granularity and go into that level of thought. So the fifth thing I want to pick up before I uh, move on. So a lot of the requirements are saying you must do this, you must do that, you must do the other. And you know, that, that, that's great. But you know, we, again, we want to try and keep the requirements short. We can't necessarily say exactly how you should do something. But we didn't want to just leave it as do this, but not say how to do that. So we've tried wherever possible to sort of include guidance and include ideas about, well, if you want to do this, then here's a way you can do it. So for example, um, this part of, uh, of chapter nine, where we talk about configuring transport layer security securely, we reference a great tool from uh, Mozilla that allows creating secure configurations. It gives you a whole list of you know, what, what web server you're using, what uh, technology you're using, what uh, level of, of uh, configuration do you want. It lets you generate a configuration file for that particular server software that will be a secure configuration file. So it's not just about what you have to do, but it also starts giving you a, a pointer of how you should do it. And that's something that we've we've tried to do wherever we can. And uh, in particular, the uh, the OS Cheat Sheets project, which is another another really great uh, OS project you should certainly be aware of, um, which contains detailed information about how to um, perform certain security activities or do certain features in a secure way. So for the Cheat Sheets project, there's a mapping between ASVS and the Cheat Sheets project that says for this section of ASVS, what cheat sheets might be useful to you in order to, to carry this out. And certainly, you know, especially where we see that you know, leading practice can, can change and be more dynamic in certain cases, we may say, well, you, know, you need to carry this out according to current leading practice, where current leading practice might be what uh, is currently in the cheat sheet. So this is another great resource for not just what to do, but also how to do it. So how can I use it? Um, I guess, you know, practical real world use. I mean, at the moment we've seen ASVS in lots of different contexts. A lot of organizations are using it internally to drive their security uh, application security processes and to drive their security application security assessments. Uh, we're particularly seeing an uptake in public sector organizations and governmental organizations or you know, government itself to look at you know, building regulation around it and building into their overall regulations for building secure software and uh, we're certainly seeing a lot, a lot of take up and a lot of interest in that and the direction we're also seeing is, is that not just individual organizations but the SVS will 
hopefully start to be used to as a, a benchmark for entire ecosystems of applications or entire ecosystems of uh, products to say, well, if you want to be in this ecosystem, you need to comply with the relevant requirements from, from ASVS. And that's uh, a really great direction to perform a, a much wider or get a much wider level of assurance over a wide set of applications. And then you know, there are certain organizations that are in a position to um, enforce that level of uh, comprehensiveness and enforce that level of security across a wide range of applications. And it's certainly a, a great trend. And uh, I'm hoping that soon we'll be able to talk about a particular partnership we have in that area that uh, is hopefully going to lead to a wide level of security for a wider range of applications. I mean, in terms of specific, what can we use it for? So it fits a, a wide range of different type activities in the, AS, in the SDLC in the software development lifecycle. Maybe it's for either developing security requirements or developing requirements which are secure. Um, it can be used to think about, well, how do I want to design a feature to work in a secure way? So what considerations do I need to take into account? It can help for implementation. It can help for the practical, how should I do this particular function? How should I, uh, what algorithm should I use for this particular function? So it certainly doesn't replace your SDLC. It can't tell you how to build a secure software development lifecycle, but it can be used in certain activities to you know, provide valuable guidance, valuable input into, okay, well, how, should, how should I do this? What do I need to think about here? Another possible area is procurement. Um, and that may be trying to make sure that third-party products you're bringing into your environment or that you're using are following a security standard, they're following an application security standard, they're being built in a secure way. Um, another interesting way that it could be used in, in procurement is if you're buying a security product or you're buying a security service and you want to understand, well, which of these requirements is this security product helping me to comply with? You know, if this is a, a web application firewall, which of the SVS requirements can it help with? Which will it, uh, which will it uh, be able to enforce? And that's also a useful way of comparing both comparing between different products and also understanding, well, you know, what, what extra security is this bringing me? And finally, like I said earlier, it can be used in an assessment. It can be used in as a as a framework for penetration testing, and also be pre prepared used to think about QA as well. If QA are trying to think, well, how am I going to uh, make sure that uh, this new feature that's been deployed is secure? It can be used as a as a way of thinking. Well, it, it, I might want to think about this item or this item or this requirement, and make sure this requirement is the case. So there are a quite wide range of ways we can we can use this, and wide wide uh, range of contexts that we can use this in. So what's a long-term plan? Um, what I've been speaking about up until now is how the standard is in version 4.0. But right now, we're looking ahead. We're looking to version 5. Um, we recently released the roadmap for version 5, um, which includes both a timeline and also our principles, our aims, what we want to see in version 5. So firstly, in terms of timescales, we are hoping to release version 5 by the end of the year. Um, it's quite an aggressive timescale. There's a lot to do, but we're hoping that we can uh, push that forward. The most recent version was released in um, early 2019. The version 4.0, or the most recent major version, version 4.0.x, was released in 2019. And we feel like you know, now, now is the time to get an updated version out. So the idea is that we'll discuss the uh, current GitHub comments over the next couple of months. Uh, we, in theory, said that we're going you know, to close for new comments, but yeah, we'll uh, certainly re review new comments on a best efforts basis. So if you start looking through now and you have key feedback, then you know, do open a comment and we will try and get to those as well. The idea is that over the course of uh, August to October, we'll start writing the draft for 5.0 based on the 4.0 text, but obviously there'll be a lot of, a lot of things that are moved around and are generally uh, you know, tidied up obviously incorporating the results of the discussions from the open comments. Um, we left three months for that because uh, we too need to have holidays. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big undertaking. And then the idea is that November, December, we should get comments on a draft of version 5.0 with names and then releasing at the end of the year. So for 5.0, our key principles are we want to make it easier to use. We want to make the standard even easier than it is at the moment. We want to lower the barrier to entry. Um, and that involves 
clarifying existing requirements and making sure that um, it's clear from each requirement what exactly needs to be happen, maybe reorganizing based on feedback, and generally making sure that it's as easy as possible to understand the requirements that are there. Um, we've had minor versions since version four, but we can, we've can we always avoided changing the meaning too much of requirements because we don't want to break things across minor versions. But with 5.0, we can break things if we feel it's necessary to increase the clarity of the uh, requirements and increase the understandability of the standard. Um, we also want to enhance the explanations on how the levels are split, how they work, and potentially reduce the barrier to entry, maybe make level one easier to achieve because you know, the important thing is that an organization can get started and they can get to the first level. And once they get to the first level, it's going to be easier for subsequent levels as well. We want to make that as, as easy as possible to achieve without compromising security. And there's a fine balance there, but to a certain extent, we'd rather have, you know, we'd rather, rather compromise slightly on, okay, this is the very minimum level of security. If it means that a lot more organizations will take the standard and use the standard more widely and uh, work more closely with it. The mappings, there are various different mappings. We're considering moving those to sort of a different part of the uh, repository, just making them slightly less in your face because we want the requirements to be front and center. We want what you need to do straight away to be the most clear thing on the on the standard. And as part of that, we also want to streamline the document and make sure that it's as easy as possible to start using a document, start understanding the document. At the moment, there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of surrounding text, a lot of introduction text, a lot of uh, explanations, and we're we're not sure how much people are using that and how much they're just looking at the requirements. And we may want to try and prioritize or, I guess, emphasize the requirements over the explanatory text because that's the, the crux of what organizations need to follow. So that's the plan five, 5.0. And the question is, uh, well, how can you be involved in this? So first of all, user standard. Um, version, the most recent stable version is 4.0.3. That's all on the uh, the GitHub repository. You can find that uh, as well as various different output formats of that version on uh, the 4.0.3 tree. And it should also be the uh, contents of the 4.0 directory in the uh, master as well. But you know, if you want to be sure, you can use that tree. And that tree is stuck to version 4.0.3 and isn't being affected by any ongoing um, discussions or ongoing uh, work towards 5.0. If you want to see the uh, in-progress version, which is sort of constantly changing, constantly being modified in the run-up to version five, then you can see that in that uh, in, the, in the master uh, branch and the 5.0 directory. Obviously, bear in mind that's a moving target that's going to keep changing. But if you want the most up-to-date guidance, that's the, the best place to find it. Um, there's also various different presentations about ASVS in the, that you can use to uh, communicate, spread the good word, and um, you know, talk to your own organizations about ASVS. Uh, thanks to uh, Andrew van der Stock, who's your creator the basis for this in the beginning. Thanks a million, Josh. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, um, just a couple more slides. Is that okay? Yeah, sure, sure, of course. We will have a few questions just to be conscious of time. So we have at least two, three questions for you. So okay, you. so just a couple more slides and we'll go to questions. That's okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, don't just use the standard, contribute your ideas as well, provide your feedback. And um, yeah, you can, there's in guidance on contributing at the link here. You can also provide translations and also talk about how you're using it and give your feedback on how you're using it. Um, you can also support the standard. We now have a, a supporters program. We're very grateful to uh, one consult who uh, are supporting ASVS as a tertiary supporter and uh, a Piro who are supporting us as a, an associate supporter. Um, and you can support the project as part of your OWASP corporate membership or directly. There are also primary and secondary support levels. Um, and that you know, would greatly help us to, to spend more time on the project and, and generally increase the awareness of the project. And as a final point, I'd like to thank our, our maintaining supporters who are organizations that let the project leaders work on the organization time to, to keep the project moving and to uh, make sure that we can you know, achieve what we want, want to achieve with the project. So thank you very much to uh, Clarified Security, Bounce Security, and Manicode for, for their support on that. So that's the SVS. Um, thank you very much for your time today. I hope that's been a, a useful overview that helped you understand both what the current state is and also what the, the future plans are. If you have questions, feedback, information, you want to speak to me, you want to 
get involved with the project. There are a lot of links here that will hopefully help you for that. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, that was an amazing presentation and a lot of information. So that's why you have questions. <laughs> <laughs> and first question for you. Uh, with a giant fast-paced development, what would be the recommended verification period for a single application? Would it be better for uh, ASVS to also have a set of definitions of them per section based on the requirements so those can be included easily in user stories? So that's a good question. I know that um, you know ultimately the the requirements are written in a way that you should be able to read the requirement and then understand what's needed to actually comply with that requirement and what you should expect to see if that requirement's been complied with. What we may have in the near future um, is an additional guide for the SBS. It's more like a testing guide to say, well, if you want to verify that this requirement is being satisfied or this set of requirements is being satisfied here are specific tests you can carry out to verify this now this is you know, the, the, there's already already an os project which is the uh um the web app security testing guide but that's written it's sort of not written in in in, in terms of verifying against the sps it's more of a general sort of penetration testing guidance document and the idea is to have a a, a guide that's part of the sps that gives more specific and tests structured based on the SVS for how to verify that particular requirements are being satisfied. And that could be, be potentially used as a definition of done for a particular requirement by saying, well, you know, if we carry out this test, is it passing successfully? We, you know, can we see this requirement has been successfully complied with? Um, so I hope, that, I hope that answers the question. If, if it hasn't done them, yeah, please feel free to follow up or get in touch with me afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Uh, another question is, so is this like CIS benchmarks, but for code? Is this like CIS benchmarks, but for code? Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm to give a, a long or a short answer. Um, I'm going to start off with a minor dig at CIS. Um, if you want to use CIS benchmarks, you're limited in how you can use those. Um, and uh, there's sort of certain licensing agreements around that and you kind of use them in certain contexts whereas the asvs is uh, freely licensed anyone can take it anyone can use it anyone can fork it with attribution and you can do what you need to do so it's a lot more flexible from that perspective um other than that it is along the same sort of lines the idea is you should be able to verify particular characteristics as characteristics of the software um cis benchmarks tend to be very sort of configuration focused and very sort of focused on a particular technology and that lets them be a little and that makes it a little bit easier to sort of okay is this value set is this value set is this value set um in a configuration file for example it makes it a lot easier to automate svs is a little bit more general because it's trying to look at the application as a whole so it's not quite as as clean to verify that particular requirement is um being correctly carried out like i said the testing guide will hopefully help with that and there's been some work to say well for some of these requirements we're going to create some sort of automation that can verify these requirements automatically um but it's not necessarily straightforward for every requirement um but certainly in terms of the principle of you know here's the security things you should you know the, the requirements you'd expect to see from pieces of software and you know here are the things you're going to want to verify it, you know, it certainly does uh, have a similar approach to the cis benchmark thank you very much uh, another question, how can companies get certified against the S uh, ASVS? Yes, so this is a question I get asked a lot. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a tricky question. You know, there's no, there is no ASVS certification. You know, this isn't like ISO or SOC 2. You don't get a pretty document at the end or some sort of magic certificate. Um, so you know, it's, it's not quite that straightforward. I think that the the easiest way i've seen is if you already have penetration testing being performed if you can ask your tester if they can structure the test in such a way they can give you feedback on how the application performs based on the requirements of the svs uh, it does require a little bit more work but it can give you a slightly you know, a penetration testing report will usually be you know this was bad this was bad this was bad this was bad and if we can replace that with a report saying, well, we didn't find any issues in this requirement area, we didn't find any issues with this requirement area, we didn't find any issues, or we did find an issue with this requirement because this, you know, we were able to do this. And that gives you a far more comprehensive picture of you know, how, how the application is doing. So that's uh, that's one possibility. Um, and it's possible that 
you know, consultancies might start offering some sort of informal review against the ASVS, but you know there is there isn't an official process at the moment. Um, but it may be work possible to work with a, a security consultancy to find a way of incorporating the SVS into a review. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. And if I would like to get more in-depth information about using ASVS, what should I do? Where can I get this information? Um, yeah, so I've you know, I try and cover as much as possible here, and you know, I think a lot of, there can be a lot of valuable information from just reading through the standard and sort of trying to understand the the requirements and you know, feeling free to ask questions. The, the Slack channel is quite active, and uh, we quite we try and be active on the on the GitHub repository as well. Although Slack is probably more responsive in terms of simple questions. Um, other than that, um, I. <laughs> I also deliver, deliver training sort of more in depth about using the SVS, um, sort of things that can't be covered in a, in a short, uh, uh, a short training at a short uh, conference session like this. I do also have training that covers a wider basis, how to use SVS, how to take a, you know, how to get an application security mindset, how to build security requirements, um, and then you know, use the SVS as, as a guide for that. And, uh, but that's, that's obviously something that's a lot more involved, and if that's something that you're interested in and you want to do some more in-depth training on that, then you can uh, you can be in contact with me, and we can we can see what we can do. Thank you very much. Anything else you would like to add, Josh, at the end of your session? So we don't have any more uh, questions, but maybe anything else on the OWASP ASVS? Um, no, I just, you know, I just want to reinforce the key messages that. You know, number one, you know, please, you know, please do start using this. Do start uh, trying to integrate this into your uh, overall assessment and uh, sort of development processes. It's certainly a, I think there's another standard that's specifically focused on applications that's like this. And uh, I think we're going to see more take up of this standard, certainly from a regulatory perspective as we go forward. So you know, certainly getting, getting ahead of that and getting starting to get sort of in the loop and start using it is going to be of a, a big benefit to, to any organization. Um, and yeah, please be involved as well. Feel free to be involved in the GitHub repository and uh, give your feedback, and give your ideas and ask questions. You know, we very much welcome community feedback to try and make sure that the, uh, the standard fits well for everyone and makes sense for everyone. And uh, yeah, generally keep it as the uh, high quality standard that it is today. So uh, yeah, and uh, thanks very much everyone for, for joining today. I appreciate it. And thanks uh, for, for moderating Svetlana. Appreciate it. Thank you, Josh. I, I just wanted to ask, how big is now the community? How many people uh, all over the world uh, uh, in your community? Or maybe just if you're talking about your country. <laughs> a good question. And... So we do have a list of contributors, um, which we sort of update with each uh, minor release. And certainly we've had probably, I don't know the exact number, something like you know, 50 to 100 people who've had some contribution within the standard, whether that be um, review or submitting suggested wording, and then probably another 10 or so who've made major contributions and have done either a lot of review or provided a lot of content um, on top of the leaders. So uh, you know, it's, it's certainly a, a lar large group of people. And, you know, that doesn't count people who just sort of ask questions or raised issues in the issue, in issue section, but never actually, you know, we, either we sort of committed to look at the, the feedback directly or you know, it got discussed without uh, actions being taken. Um, but certainly, we you know, we always welcome more interest and more feedback as well. And uh, during COVID, did you have online sessions, regular online sessions with your community, or how how did it work for the community? So, the you know, in terms of interacting with the community, it's it's mostly you know, there's no sort of formal process for you know, ongoing uh, meetings or ongoing discussions. It's more the you know, the asynchronous discussions in, in the GitHub repository. And that's really, you know, between the GitHub repository and the Slack channel, that's the uh, the main venue for, for discussions on ASVS. And it's very much done in, a, in, in an async basis. I guess we could look, you know, we could look at doing um, town hall meetings or wide, wider focus group meetings if necessary. But uh, ultimately having the sort of the asynchronous approach and using the, using the chat and using the issues I think it helps to give people time to, to, to you know, read through the thoughts and provide their own thoughts. And you know, that's a wide range of people contribute. So uh, that, that seems to work quite well. 
Thanks. That was amazing. I think people found a lot of answers during your sessions, uh, your session. And uh, if you will need uh, to contact uh, Josh, please contact. Please be the active part of community. And thank you very much for your questions and for your great presentation.